it was impressed on me to um, have an in-person Bible study. <laughs> I like to call it a Bible transformation, you know, because you can study a thing. 2,000 years ago, there was a group of folks who had the whole thing studied really well, but then the thing appeared in front of them and they killed it. So I'm not really sure how much study can do. Actually, Scripture says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So this is what happens. The, uh, David doesn't know what to do, so he builds a sukkah, a shack, a dilapidated tent. The, 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 the translations vary. Uh, some say sukkat David, some say mishkan David. Mishkan is like a tent. At either way, it's not a temple. It's this dilapidated thing. And if it was a sukkah, it would have had like four, uh, uh, four posts, a wall that went around it, and then just some sheets up top or some branches up top, right? And then... What did he do? Well, let, let me move this post over. That's the, nice thing about, that's the nice thing about having something that's not fancy. You can just move it over. It doesn't even matter. I like that. You just move it over. It's like, no, nah, I want it here. That's where I want it. <laughs> I like that. There's, there's revelation in that. And so what does he do? He brings the Ark of the Covenant, and he sets it in this dilapidated tent there's one cherub there's the other cherub and when he puts it there all of a sudden <laughs> now here's the amazing thing this is what became Mishkan David. This is what became the tabernacle of David or the fallen tent of David. It was basically a little dilapidated shack with the Ark of the Covenant in it and the presence of God came. Now here's what's fascinating about this. Because there was no temple, there was no outer court, there was no inner court, there was no holy place. There was no holy of holies. There was no labor to bathe yourself. There was no menorah. There was no table of showbread. There was just a dilapidated tent with the Ark of the Covenant with God's presence in it, which meant it didn't matter if you were black, white, male, female, Gentile, cockroach, goat, possum, whatever you were, if you, if you came by the tent, you started to prophesy. You started to dance. I mean, if you could just see the goats dancing in the Jerusalem, the, it's, it, because the presence of God was radiating to everybody in, in a way that was amazing. And only the priests, the only one priest once a year could experience that, but in this dilapidated tent, anybody could experience it. You didn't have to be a Levite. You didn't have to be a Kohen, a descendant of, of, of Aaron. You, it didn't matter if you were Gentile. It, no matter who you were, there was, it was like there was no rules about coming into the presence of God. And this is what God is saying on this day, on this generation, I ain't building no temples. I ain't building no churches. I ain't having no revivals. I am rebuilding this thing that David set up so that everybody can come into my presence and nobody will be ostracized. Nobody will be pushed away. Nobody will be saying, oh, you're not part of us. You can't be part of this. Oh, you don't know how to say Baruch Atah per perfectly. You can't come and do this. God is saying, I am establishing this. I'm building this. A tent that is broken and busted up and dilapidated and it has my presence in it. I don't know about you, but, but I delight in that. I delight in that. 
I delight in that because it means that our Father loves us so much, he says, I don't know, I'm going to set up some way, somehow, so that all these rules that separate people will no longer work. And I don't care if you're a hooker. I don't care if, if you're a tax collector. I don't care if you're a thief. I don't care what you are. You will have access to my presence and not just an outer court presence. Let me tell you something. When the tabernacle was moving, if you came close to the outer court, you could feel the presence of God. God is saying, I don't want you to have an outer court experience with me. I don't even want you to have a holy, a holy place experience with me. I want you to have a holy of holies experience with me. When you enter into this place and you realize I love you because I love you because I love you because I love you. You know what? Because I love you. And his love consumes consumes our incorrect thoughts. His love consumes our doctrines. His love consumes the walls that separates us, that causes us to call him like I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a Baptist. God is saying, what in the world is going on? I am establishing a place that has no walls and my sons and daughters are still stuck trying to put little walls around themselves and dividing themselves. And then they wonder, when is Jesus coming? Oh, you don't understand. Jesus is here. It's just that he's all chopped up into a million pieces. He's got a Presbyterian finger here. He's got a Baptist toe there. Don't you know that the coming of Jesus was already prophesied, but we don't understand because what do we think? We think we're humans waiting for Jesus to come. We don't understand. The coming of Jesus was prophesied by King David, the one who brought this little thing in here. And King David said, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers, when brothers dwell together in unity. And the word in unity is echad. Echad, which is the title held for God alone. For hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is echad. David is saying, when you become echad like God, when you become one, when you become like your heavenly father, one, then it is the anointing oil that comes on the head and see, we read anointing or we don't understand. In Greek language, it is the Christos, it is the Christ. It is the Christ oil that comes on the head of Aaron and drips down his beard. It mentions beard. Why? Because God is saying, y'all need to mature, man. It, it, this can't fall on a little kid. It has to fall on maturity. And it comes down his beard and it drips down to the skirts of his garment. Can I tell you something? The skirts of his garment meaning Jesus is the head, we are the body. Whatever he gets, we get. And the coming of Christ is not us waiting for some dude in the clouds like, Woo! Oh, Gabriel, you forgot the horn. Oh, crap. I was texting. No, the coming, the coming, the coming is the appearing. It's when we become one. When we become one, we're two more are gathered when we become one then the world can see that the son was sent and Jesus said father I pray that they be one even as you and I are one you and me and me and them and then the world will know that you have sent me it is the unity of God's people so God is saying David established this and anybody could come near it and feel the presence Feel my presence. And in the presence of God, something amazing happens. You fall because you realize how short, how short you come to his glory, to his grace. But he's the God who kneels. He's the God who kneels. Like we think, oh, I got to kneel before the Lord. You don't understand. Long before you kneel before the Lord, God has kneeled in front of you as a dad, as a mom to pick you up and put you on his shoulders. He's the one who goes lower. I don't care how low you are, he goes lower. He goes lower. Ain't nobody can go lower than him. He goes lower to pick you up. 
And this was an establishment he wanted to do. He says, you don't understand. You're all trying to build all these temples, all these fancy things, all these amazing things. Yes, you're beautiful. I understand. But what I'm doing has nothing to do with physical beauty of buildings. I'm setting up a little shaky, dilapidated tent where my presence can be in there and anybody can be in my presence. This is why I've said this before. I mean, when I first got here, th- there, there was a saying, you know, there was a saying, you know, do you know that this church is the most photographed church in New England? I said, what the hell do I give a crap about how many pictures someone can take of anything? The Father would want us to have a saying, this place <laughs> is a place where the most miracles of God have happened because people became one and they love one another. That's the, that, that, that's, that's the only thing we want to be known for. That's what we want to be known for. Because, <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble. It's all right. It's all right. You see? 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 I don't care how tall that is. That can never do what this does. You know why? Because when God establishes this, this can be gone, but this is still here. Yes. This is what the thing, this is the thing that we don't understand. Do you realize that if something ever happened where, where there is no funds to take care of a building, do you think it matters to God? God says, set up a in the backyard everybody will come people are drawn to that in fact the reason why people are coming here is because God is so crazy he's figured out a way to put this in there too he don't care where we put it he'll put it in the bathroom and I know this because years ago we were having a service and the Lord says this is when I was young and and really crazy I've turned it down a little bit in my old age but God said to me here's what you gotta do Rabbi Peter when everybody comes to the service on Shabbat tell them everybody you want a service follow me and I got in my car and I drove off and some people were waiting and they're still probably waiting wondering where I went but others came and they followed and we went and we drove through the streets. I didn't even know where I was going. I says, Lord, you told me to drive and tell the people to follow you, but you didn't tell me where to go. And the Lord says, well, welcome to Moses' world because that's what he had to do for 40 years. No clue. Where are we going? I don't know. Just got to go where the cloud leads you. And I drove around and drove around. The Lord led, led me to an old abandoned state park that had bathrooms that hadn't been used in years but they still had stuff in it somehow i don't understand how and one of the doors was open and the lord says open the door and go in there that's where you're going to have your service today and i went in there and there was about 50 people who crammed into a toilet room with dried up crap in the toilets And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, don't you know that right now you have brothers and sisters in in, in China, in the Sudan, in Afghanistan, in Africa who are suffering worse than this and they still have to figure out a way to worship me and gather together to praise my name. And from that place, we were praising the Lord and we asked, Lord, encourage our brothers and sisters right now who have only this. And we never prayed so earnestly for people ever because now, now we're suffering. We're suffering a little bit. What kind of suffering? It's not even suffering. Like we spent like an hour in the toilet. Like, like that's suffering. Oh, Lord, woe is me. God is saying, I'm rebuilding this. Obviously, you got to know I'm not, I'm not knocking anything. What I'm saying is this is what God is doing. And he'll do this in there. He'll do this everywhere. He don't care where he's going to do it. He just wants to make sure that wherever his word is, people can come and experience his presence. Does that make any sense? (laughs) That's... That's, that's what the Father is doing, understanding this. So now, now how, how does this relate to us? Because, because this is a prophecy spoken 
by Amos. Now, Amos comes many years after David did this. So David did this, and nobody understood what he was doing. As a matter of fact, this would seem to be somewhat unorthodox, to say the least. In fact, in some ways, it could even be viewed as, uh, um, what do you call it? What do, what do you call it when someone claims to be God or whatever? It's, uh, sacrilegious. That, that's sacrilegious. How, David, how, how can you do that when you know that only the high priest can be near that? And David is saying, believe me, I know, I wanted to build a temple, but the Lord says no, so I can't leave that out in the street. I had to put a little tent to cover it. Go talk to God about it. I love it. I love it. And this is what he said. That's, that's what I'm going to... That's what I'm going to rebuild. The tabernacle of David that was fallen. Now David's son built the temple and oh my God. That thing was so amazing that even after they knock it down, somebody else built it up again. And it was still so amazing. I mean, can you imagine Jesus is walking with the disciples now, this is Jesus. Like, God is walking with the disciples, and they're like, oh, oh, Lord, have you seen the columns? And he's like, what? What? Is that what you call them now? Are these columns? Lord, Lord, look at it. And he said it. Take down this house. In three days, I will raise it up again. And the amazing thing is if you hear what he's saying and you miss the, prop, the prophetic, you think he's saying, I'm going to rebuild a temple. And you don't understand, no, 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 I'm rebuilding the house. The house I'm rebuilding is the tabernacle of David because that's what was prophesied long ago. I ain't making this fancy place that, that a group of people can think that they can own it. No, no, I'm doing what was prophesied. By Amos 9-11, I'm building a shack to put my, my, my presence in, to put the commandments in. How does this relate with us? Well, last week we, we read from the book of Acts. Now, I love this because the book of Acts, like actually, as a matter of fact, the whole New Testament is a big mess. I'll tell you why it's a big mess, because if you read the New Testament from a mindset that has separated yourself from your Hebraic roots, it makes no sense. But when you begin to realize, wait a minute, did God make that separation or did humans make that separation? Because if humans made it, I want to understand scripture with the mind of the king of Israel. I want to understand this from the mind of the God who brought the son into this world. I want to understand this from the mind of the God who spoke on Mount Sinai to, to, to Moses. I want to understand this from the mind of God, not from the mind of man-made religion and certainly not from secular humanism that just says, to make me feel good. It is, it, is, it is a frustrating thing. You'll just have to excuse, you have to excuse. It's a frustrating thing because there's, there's so much being said to make us feel good and God is saying, no, you don't understand. This is not about feeling good. This is not about, this is, no one can take a page out of this thing. This stays intact. This doesn't change. What changes is the little tabernacle that it was put in. See, that other, that other temple had all kinds of rules and regulations, but this little tabernacle, anybody can come near it. Now people go to Bible school and learn how to talk and say things that won't upset people. Why? Because, because if you upset people, that's not good financially. You know what I mean? The people stop giving. They, they stop coming. And, and we forget that, that the teacher of all teachers, the rabbi of all rabbis, what does he do? Oh, he had, oh, 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 he had many, many followers. And what did he do? He started talking in, in, in parables so nobody could understand what on earth he was talking about. So they only showed up when he made bread and fish. And then he, and then he had like about a hundred or so. And he's looking at them and he says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you got no place in me. 
So a whole bunch of them left, and there's 12 left. And he made sure to the last day on earth that he wouldn't have a single, a single, a single follower on the last day. And even those who wanted to follow him couldn't because it was Shabbat, so they had to go home anyway. He's like, oh, that, that's, that's how he builds his congregation, completely opposite to the way humans do it. Humans are trying to build numbers, and he's like, what are you doing building numbers? I don't need numbers. I just need one. I just need one. I just need you to be one. That's it. Just one. Just one. Just one. Father, I pray that they will be. It's so simple. It's so simple, yeah. Echad. Echad is so simple. So now we have a big dilemma because as the disciples are trying to figure out what are we going to do now, we were so close to the kingdom arriving. I mean, the, our master, he was raising the dead feeding people for free. He, everything was perfect. He could silence storms. He could do all these things. Then he dies. So that was like a bummer. And then, and, and then he resurrected. But then he's like vanishing and appearing. And it's like, Lord, when are we going to do this? And then he leaves. Now what do we do? I mean, talk about like an emotional roller coaster, right? Now what do we do? And they're forgetting. Guys, you forgot. This is what he's setting up. This is what he's setting up. And all of a sudden, something comes up. There's an issue. Some guys from Judea show up, and they say, hey, all these Gentiles are coming in, like filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, no, 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 no. Unless they're circumcised, they are not saved. You remember that? That's in that. Now this is important because, because this information is what triggers the memory of this prophecy. Now pay close attention to this. The issue was we don't want these Gentiles coming in here and messing everything up. By the way, don't be hard. Don't be hard on those Jews who are believers who are saying that. Don't be hard, lest the Lord start bringing all kinds of crazy transvestites in here dressed in speedos, speaking with the Holy Ghost, and we're like, all right, we recognize they got the Holy Spirit, but we can't be dressed like this in here. It's amazing what God is doing. You'd be amazed. Someone says one word, one word that's off color. That'll mess you up for days. I've had, I've had people, I've, oh my God, I've had people literally text me a year after they heard me say something. They says, what? I have been meaning to ask you this question. I'm like, I'm thinking it's like some kind of crazy revelation. Oh, what is it? What is it? Like, well, and they got the date on 1970, whatever the date is, 2011, whatever. You said, damn I was like, oh, man, I don't know how to answer because I th I'm thinking i got to answer some kind of a spiritual thing. And I'm like, I don't remember, I don't remember that. But, you know, dam is like, it's like this thing that holds back water, and it's holding back the flow of God. I don't know. I'm trying to make something up. <laughs> <laughs> and we forget, we forget that when we're sitting down listening to someone who's expounding on the word of God, it's like you're sitting in a restaurant eating a steak. When you eat T-bone steak, you don't bite into the bone and say, Ugh, I'm suing, there's a T-bone in my T-bone steak. I done hurt myself. You got to cut around and eat the meat. Anybody who comes to listen to what I have to say, you're wasting your time. You should be here to say, Father, the vessel is the dilapidated tent for sure. But I want to hear what's coming from that. Then suddenly things that would upset you, don't even, you don't even hear them anymore because you're focused on this, not on that. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? If that's gone, 
What is that? What is that without... Yeah. Do you know how many shacks there were in Jerusalem in David's day? Thousands? Hundreds of thousands? Why did people come to this one? There's only one reason. Only one reason. Because, not because they looked good, not because it was sturdy and sound, not because, oh, when it rains, that's the place you want to go. No, there were places that were much stronger than that, much more beautiful. No, simple, because in it was the ark of God that held the commandments of God. His presence was there. Manna, rod, oops, says the Lord. You forgot to look in it. They looked in it. There was no manna and there was no rod. But there was the tablets and the Torah. The manna and the rod disappeared. Can I tell you that the manna and the rod are connected to signs and wonders? I mean, seriously. It, is anybody amazed or amused by a Torah scroll other than if you're Jewish in this room? Is anybody am amazed? Like, oh, 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 look, oh! Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. You don't count. Yes, you do. You see what I'm saying? But, but, if I brought Aaron's rod in here that's still budding and manna so that we could try some of this manna, we'd all be freaking out. Amazing. God, in the tabernacle of David, did not allow the signs and wonders to be in here. He says, I don't want you to be influenced by signs and wonders. I want you to experience my presence, and my presence is in my Torah. My presence is in my word, not in fancy bells and whistles. My presence is my word. I'm establishing the tabernacle of David, which was a dilapidated shack that simply had the Ark of the Covenant with my word, nothing else. Oh my gosh, it puts things into perspective. Are you hearing this? Are you hearing this? The amusement is out. We want to see the rod! Bonk. Wait, I want to... Here's a cup of coffee. I want to see it. I want to eat the manna. We want all these things that are so exciting. And the father says, no, that none, those things are gone. All there was is the old, bore, the old boring word. Ancient word, ever true. Changing me and changing you. <laughs> we'll come to open up the devoting part. But listen, this, this is the war that we're facing. Because in this generation, the word of God is being shut up to the point where there's churches who literally don't have a Bible with an Old Testament. They have a New Testament Bible. And if you go in there, they'll say, by the way, this is a New Testament church. I know of people who went into a church worshiping the Lord and they put on a little tallit and someone went up to them, an usher went up to them and says, excuse me, we don't wear curtains here. This is a New Testament church, a New Covenant church. None of that old stuff flows here. And it's crazy because this is happening in this time, in this season, in this generation. A, wa a war against the Word of God. I have people around here asking me or saying to me, you don't really believe that everything written in that book is real, do you? Yeah, I do. Amen. Well, how do you suppose God said let there be light, but the sun wasn't even around till the fourth day? <laughs> well, I reckon you're going to have to ask God that question because I ain't God. It's amazing. The war against the Word of God. As if we could go through the Word of God and pick and choose the things that make sense to us and the things that we disagree so we can just cut them out. It says, no, no, not for me. 
Not for me. David was not like that. Most of everything in the, in the Torah, he screwed up, but he never threw it away. You understand? In fact, keeping Torah is amazing. Keeping doesn't mean, oh, I do everything in it. No, it just means I keep it. I hold on to it, man. I'm, I, I, I got to keep it because I screw it up all the time. I got to keep it. I got to go back to the manual once in a while. I'm keeping it. <laughs> I'm a keeper. <laughs> I'm a keeper of the Torah. <laughs> That's what it means. And God is saying, oh, there's a war, there's a war, there's a war. We are living in a generation that people, people don't even know how to speak to other people. We, don't, we have to worry about what pronouns we speak to somebody. Next time someone tells me what pronoun to use, I'm going to tell them, you are to refer to me as thou. <laughs> because that's how I identify. <laughs> I... I <laughs> Those of you who know me well know I am not speaking against anybody. I am speaking about a system that is convincing humanity that that makes sense. When all along God is saying, don't you understand anything that does not match the Garden of Eden is broken. Like, I'm dyslexic. I don't go around trying to force dyslexia on people. It's my own thing that I have to figure out how to navigate through this life. And all of us have to navigate things that are very difficult. But we don't push our brokenness and force others to accept that, that they're broken too and that's okay and let's just start a whole dyslexia group because that's the way we should read. Backwards, in, inside out. No, it's something that I have to work out with. And that's why we have to love one another, encourage one another, not bash people up because you don't know the journey they're going through. But the system in this world, the anti-Christ system in this world wants to destroy the word of God so we don't have the manual to fall back on when things are broken. I'm going to have Al read. And Al, you don't have to read Amos 9-11. We know we've already spoken about the prophecy that was spoken. So I'm just going to have you begin at uh, um, Acts 15, verse 6. And we did read this last week, but there's even more things in there that we just gleaned from that are amazing. And I want you to check this out. If you have your Bibles, you can open it. So Acts 15, verse 6 to 21. And I will be stopping you, Al. So please forgive me. <laughs> the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the word of the gospel and believe. Stop right there. There's something right there that we miss if we don't understand the person speaking or he's, who he's speaking to. He says right there at the end, it says, um, by the way, he's just saying, you know that long ago God chose me to speak the word to the people, through the Gentiles. That's what he's saying. We know it's Peter because Peter had the vision of the sheet of the, of the animals coming down. You remember that? So, so God used Peter to begin the ministry that was going to go to the Gentiles. He began it. He didn't finish it. Paul actually kind of took over because Paul was ministering to all the Gentiles, okay? Now, there's something that he's speaking. Now, we got to remember the audience. This is a Jew talking to a bunch of Jews. Some of them were Pharisees that believed Jesus was the Messiah, okay? So these are believing Jews that he's talking to because the issue is what? What's the issue? Snip, snip, right? No snip, no kingdom. Now, I, I, I got to tell you this. That is just cruel. I mean, uh, there are 613 commandments in the Torah. Why did they pick that one? Any guess? Any guess? Eh? Eh? Because <laughs> for sure, <laughs> for sure, <laughs> that's the only commandment that would require all kinds of pain. And most people say, I don't know if I can do that. You know, so they really wanted to make sure they kept these guys out of the, out of the little synagogue, right? So anyway, so a Jew is talking to Jews, right? And he's saying, he, uh, he's saying, um, uh, read that again, verse 7. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips 
The word of the gospel. Okay, the word of the gospel. The word of the gospel. If you do a word search on that word right there, the word word, you know what that word is? It's logos. In Greek, there's, there's two words that refer to the word of God. The rhema is like, like when you hear the voice of the Lord telling you to do something, that's rhema. It's like the spirit speaking to you. Logos is the written word. Logos is the written word. Now, Peter is saying this in the first century, right? So what word was the written word when he said that? Remember, they had no Bibles. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The Torah, yes. So Peter is saying, God chose me to speak the Torah to the Gentiles. Are you catching this? This is because when we read, oh, to speak the word, it's it's very vague. It's very open. It's like the Bible. Well, the Bible wasn't didn't exist. It makes sense. What existed was the Psalms, the, the historical books, the kings and whatnot, uh, the prophets, and the Torah. So Peter is saying, God chose me to speak the Old Testament to the Gentiles. That's literally what he's saying. All right, continue. Verse 8. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Okay, stop right there. We spoke about this last week. When you read that without understanding, you think that the, the burden and the yoke is the laws of God. Well, that doesn't make any sense because Peter just said, God chose me to speak the Old Testament to the Gentiles. He wouldn't be saying, don't put that burden on the Gentiles. It doesn't make any sense. What is this burden? What is this burden he's talking about? The burden is this, that they were told, the Gentiles were told, if you're not circumcised, you cannot be saved. The burden is believing that unless you keep every commandment of God, you can't be saved. And that's what Peter said. None of us could carry that burden. That's why we had to go do animal sacrifice every day in the morning, at night. Like We know that at any point in time, we could screw up and then we'd be doomed. So he's simply saying the burden is to tell somebody that if you don't do that, you're not going to be saved. I used a little example last week. Remember I said, who here would uh, like to volunteer to spread out some salt when it's icy? And some people raised their hands, right? right? And then I said, okay, is that burdensome for you? I mean, think about it. Anyone in here, who, who, would, who wouldn't mind doing that? Who wouldn't mind salting? Wouldn't mind, right? Would that be a burden for you? No, 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 no. no. But what if I said, and if I go out there and I don't see salt, you're dead. <laughs> Does that suddenly become a burden? Yeah. Because what happens if you don't get up in time to go do it? You're dead. Yes. That's what they had said to the Gentiles. If you don't become circumcised, you're dead. You have no salvation. That's the burden that Peter's talking about. Is that clear? Most people don't understand this. The burden is not the word of God. The burden is being told if you don't follow the word of God, you're dead and you can't come into the kingdom. That's the burden. And that's a burden that the people of Israel carried all through their lives. And as a matter of fact, unless you're a Jew that believes in Messiah, you still have that burden because we don't even have a temple to have sacrifices now. We're the only... Judaism is the only religion on earth where you can't practice it according to your own instructions because there's no temple. And without a temple and without the, the red heifer, without all the sacrifices, like there's no remission of sin. So this is a big problem. So this is what Peter is saying. Look at we carry this burden. The burden was thinking that we have to, 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 to do all these things to be saved. No, no, no. God gave us his instructions. It's his manual. It's like someone saying, unless you, unless you read your, 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 the, the manual of your car, we're going to take it away. Like, what? <laughs> oh, here's a car. Here are the keys. It's full of gas. Manual in the box. Better read it every day. The day you don't read it, we're taking your car away. Like, what? You can keep the car. I don't need, I don't, I don't need more reading material. <laughs> That's what Peter's saying, the burden. Okay, go ahead, continue, Al. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
that we are saved just as they are. Stop right there. That we are saved. We believe that we are saved. All right. Anybody have another version that you're looking at? Anybody have a version that says we shall be saved? Yes. You do? Can you read it? Okay. Interesting, huh? We shall be saved. Is that present, future, past? That's future. Hmm, problem. Peter, what are you talking about? Peter, what are you talking about? Whenever you read scripture and something doesn't line up with other scriptures that you know, always stop and don't throw the Bible out. Just say, okay, Father, help me understand this. What is this word? Okay, I'm going to help you a little bit on this particular word. Uh, This is a, a, a word... And it's, um, let me see, where is it? We shall be saved. The word in Greek is sozo. Sozo. Huh? So, oh, sozo. No D in there. Sozo. Sozo. Now, I find it fascinating because in Greek, the word sozo, I could probably ask Catherine, but I just wrote down the, the, um, the definition of that word. And that word means we save, We deliver or protect, we heal, we preserve, we are saved ourselves, we do well, we make whole. You know what's crazy about what Peter just said? He's not saying that we believe we shall be saved. He's saying we believe that we save, we we preserve. It means we are the carriers of the word, so we have the authority to preserve. So you're saying the Gentiles can't be saved. We believe that we can save. We're beyond being saved. We can save because there's a prophecy saying that Savior shall come from Mount Zion and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. It's speaking of the fact that we carry salvation with us. When you're speaking to a friend, when you're sharing something with someone, you're bringing the word of salvation because Jesus said, as the Father has sent me into the world I send you so so they're stuck on trying to figure out who can be saved and Peter is saying we believe that by the grace of Jesus we can save of course Peter is the one who heard Jesus saying whatever you forgive on earth is forgiven in heaven whatever You retain on earth is retained in heaven. So Peter understands God has given us an amazing authority here and you guys are stuck on circumcision. What is wrong with you? All right, continue. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Men, brothers, listen to me. What kind of a person is speaking? Is this a Gentile speaking right now? Now, this is James, right? Who's James? I'm sorry? I think he's the brother of Jesus. Yeah, one of the disciples. Who's the audience? He's not talking to Gentiles. There's no Gentiles in the room right now. There's Pharisees who believe in Jesus. There's other disciples. There's a whole bunch of people. They're all Jews who believe in Jesus. Okay? No Gentiles here. They're talking about the Gentiles. You usually don't have the people in the room that you're talking about. I think that's the problem, right? (laughs) So the audience is important. And he says to them, he says, he calls them men, and then he stops himself, and he calls them something else. I'll read that verse again. When they finished, James spoke up. Men, brothers, listen to me. Okay. Listen. The word listen. Um, I'm probably going to kill it here, but it's uh, something like that. What is it? Help me out. Aku. 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 Now, I want you to understand this. James, a Jew, is speaking in a room full of Jews, and he says to them, men, stops, says, brothers. You know that it's a little closer. And then it says, aku, 
Aku. Why is that important? Why is that important? Why is Aku important? When a scribe went to Jesus and said to Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? As he was testing to see if Jesus knew what he was talking about. Jesus answered, the greatest commandment is this. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If you Google the word that Jesus used in Greek, it's Aku. Aku, which means when James is saying to these Jewish men, listen to me, he's saying, Shema, Shema. And when he says Shema to Jewish men, they go into attention and says, okay, God is speaking right now. I have to hear what you have to say. This is so amazing. If you don't know the culture, you miss all these things. Are you getting it? Aku is the same translated word for the Shema. Because Jesus said, Shema Israel, and in Greek it's Aku Israel. Aku. And Shema doesn't just mean, oh, just, just listen. Shema means listen with the intention to obey. Listen. It's almost like stand hut. It's like hearing your commander get your attention so that you can do the next thing he tells you to do. Are you, are you catching this? I mean, sometimes things are going through so fast through my brain. I'm like, Father, help me explain it because I don't want your sons and daughters to not get it. He rises up and says, after what Peter said, after what Paul and Barnabas explained, now I'm going to get your attention, brothers. Shema, the most important prayer, the most important commandment for the people of Israel. So they're paying attention. So what does he say after he says, Shema, Shema, Shema Israel, listen. Continue reading. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people from his, for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. Come on, somebody. That the rest of mankind may see the Lord even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. Oh, my God. Listen, so listen to this. Understand this, okay? The issue is, should we circumcise Gentiles to be saved? They're having a discussion over this. Finally, the brother of Jesus stands up and says, I got to get your attention. I'm talking something serious. Shema. Shema. Shema means stop what you're doing, pay attention because the next thing is God speaking. And he doesn't give them his opinion. He says, as it is written, as it is written on that day I shall raise up the fallen tent of David. He's saying to them, hey, Hebrew men, pay attention. Shema, God, this ain't nothing new. It's new for us. We're having to get adjusted to it because we're not familiar with these things, but God spoke about these things through his prophet, which is, I'm going to rebuild not a temple, not a church, not a synagogue. I'm building the tabernacle of David in those days, a place where everybody can come and be in my presence without division, without walls. It, 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 just, it, just, it just breaks my heart. I thought it, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Because to this day, there are lost lambs of God wandering on this broken world. And they go into a place. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a synagogue. I don't care if it's a church. I don't, I don't care what it is. And they're looking. They're looking for this. They're looking for a place that doesn't look at the outside, doesn't care what you sound like, doesn't care what you look like. They just need a place where they're going to find this. That's all they want. People are looking. I don't, care. I don't care how fancy your building is. I don't even care how much you know the Bible. I don't care how much you give to the poor. I don't care about none of that. All I care is that when I went in, I can feel the presence of God. That's all I want because if his presence is there, then I know I'm safe. That's all I want. That's all I want. And we wonder why, why so many people have drug problems and alcohol problems. You don't understand. Everyone who has a problem has a problem because they're looking for this. They're looking for that. 
And don't be angry because somebody has alcoholic problems or drug problems or whatever. Ask the Lord, Lord, why am I not manifesting this? Because if I manifest this, the people who are suffering with addiction should not feel that near me because I have your tabernacle living inside of me. Father, it's not their fault. It's me not recognizing what this means, Father. Build this thing in me. Build this thing in me. I ain't pointing the finger on somebody else because they're doing it wrong. I ask you to change me. I'm supposed to be this little dilapidated tent walking with your, with your word inside of me, with your presence. Verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from pollutions of idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Stop right there. Well, that's kind of interesting. So what does he do? He says, well, listen, let's, let's give them a little list of things. They're coming in, they're clueless, they're going in, they're Gentiles, they don't know, they're bum from their elbow, they don't, they don't know nothing, they don't know nothing. Let's give them four, how many was it? How many instructions? Four. four. Let's give them four instructions. In anything that James said, is James saying, unless, unless they do these four things, that they cannot come into the kingdom? Does James say that? No. So James is simply saying, listen, I get it. They're a mess. They're coming in. They're filled with the Spirit. Salvation has nothing to do with works. So they got that. So, but they don't know nothing. They don't know what's in here. They're coming and they're feeling the presence of God, but they don't know what's in the box. They've never read it. They don't even understand the language. So let's give them four little instructions. Four Anybody know what the letter four is in, or the number four is in Hebrew? The Dalit. Four. Anybody know what a door, the Dalit looks like? A door. A door. James is saying, listen, you guys are shutting this thing to them. I'm going to open up a little door to make sure that they're welcome in. And by the way, have you ever asked yourself, wait a minute, why is James coming up with these four things? That doesn't really make sense. Okay, so one of it is uh, don't pollute yourself with idols. The second one is don't, what? Sexual immorality. <coughs> oh, sexual immorality. Okay. The third one, don't strangle a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and the fourth one, blood. James, what are you talking about? What about don't steal? Oops, James forgot don't steal. What about honor your father and mother? No, we don't need to do that anymore. A, James, come on, James. You're forgetting a few important ones. <laughs> James, what about, you know, there's a, there's a Torah commandment that says when someone with white hair comes into the room, you're supposed to stand. James, you forgot that one has to do with honoring those who've been here a little longer than we have. Uh, James, there's one that says you cannot have sex with animals. You forgot that one. James, there's 613 commandments. You forgot a lot of them. And you gave them these lame ones. Some of them we don't even find in the Torah. What are you doing, James? Yeah, there you go. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. A lot of really good ones he missed. James, come on, snap out. James, you need to get your game on. James, at least give him the Ten Commandments. It's a good start. Nope. Four lame commandments. Which, by the way, anybody who's ever come to me and said, we're the church of the New Covenant, the New Testament church, none of them keep those four commandments. I guarantee Ain't nobody checking. When was the last time you went to buy food at the grocery store and chucked with the butcher? Says, Excuse me, butcher, come over here. Did you strangle this cow before you? <laughs> Is that a valid point? People who will say, we're a new covenant, new testament church. We don't have to keep Torah. 
Do, do any, does anybody pay attention to these four commandments that James pulled out of his pocket? <laughs> anybody? Anybody? Ah. But they wouldn't have said it if it didn't mean anything because James was just prophesying. He was just speaking. He's under the, he just said, Shema, Shema. He's saying something very important. Why is he saying this? Really simple. Because these were the four things that the Gentiles were used to doing the way they worshipped the false gods. They would bow down in front of idols. They would have temple prostitutes having sex with them. It was part of their religious experience. And then they would have to sacrifice animals by strangling them. And then they would have to bathe themselves in the blood of animals or drink the blood of animals. This was the action of their religious ways that's why James says, let's just give them a little list so that they will not go back to doing the things they did when they were trying to connect with God. These were pagan things that they were doing. But James, what about all the other commandments? I mean, there's 613 commandments. Do you think James forgot about the rest? You ready for the mic drop? Ready? Ready? Because James, you gave four. What about the rest? Why do you give four? Why? The next verse, James explains why. Here's why. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Did you catch that? James, you gave them four. What's up with that? He says, I'm giving them four. Because the law of Moses is read every Shabbat, in every synagogue, in every city, meaning the four helps them understand, and every week they learn more and more, and they get to learn more and more about the Word of God. Every year, every week, every Shabbat, they can come and learn more. Do you catch it? Because that's the answer he's, he's giving. Because uh, for, the word is for the law of Moses, meaning I'm saying this because this is what's being given every week. Let me say it another way. Let me say it another way. So you find a homeless person. They're starving. And you go up to them and say, unless you eat the whole grocery store, you're going to starve to death. And the person is starving. is like, man, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I can try. I don't know. But a person who's wise says, what are you doing? Don't tell them that. Let's just give them a banana, an apple, a pear, and some peanut butter. But what about all the other food in the store? Don't worry about it. Every week the store is open. They'll be able to go and partake of whatever food they want as they want. But none of this has to do with salvation. Salvation is a free gift of God and God gave his word so that we can enjoy it, so we can learn. And sometimes it takes baby steps. The beautiful thing about it is this, is we don't have to keep the law to be saved. The law is a gift of God, a love letter of God to us. It has nothing to do with salvation. Here's the amazing thing. Would it make any sense for God to say, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, but there's not going to be any Ark of the Covenant in it. Would that make any sense? The whole point of, of this is that it has a little Ark in it. The whole point is that this, this, is literally a reflection of every one of us because we're all these little dilapidated, broken tents. We're not all fancy. You know, we're walking around with the word of God tucked into our heart. And we trip and we fall like David did constantly. But we honor, we keep the word of God safely in our heart. Does that make sense? That makes sense. La lastly. Oh, Rabbi, you don't understand. <laughs> We're in a new covenant. 
We are the new covenant people. I say amen. You're absolutely right. Al, could you read? I think it's in the, in the, in the back page. It, it, God's description of the new covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's it. That's it. God's promise. It's not building temples. It's not building amazing religious organizations. It's simply saying the covenant that I have, that we here every month drink, we, we drink the blood of Messiah, says this is the blood of the new covenant. We don't realize what we're drinking. We're saying he shed his blood for every time I broke his law so that now I can walk with his law in my heart without the condemnation when I screw it up. And that is the new covenant. Have a blessed, 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 blessed evening.